Yeah, I'm right. I might go over there. I just open the door. The only time I close the door is at night. All right, well, thank you all for coming. We're here to talk about autocross course design. Uh, I'm Chris Perry. I've been autocross for about 20 years. I'm in my 11th year of SCCA membership and my second year being vice president of Tri-State Sports Car Council. I've personally set up about 40 autocross courses at six different sites. I've helped design and set up and deal with chairman duties at least another 40 times. I know a little bit about what goes on. I've had things happen morning of that had me change my whole design, and I've had things go exactly as planned. So I don't uh, stand here before you trying to profess I'm the best course designer in the world or not. Uh, I just love the sport a lot. I get a good understanding of uh, what a car can do and uh, how to make use of space. And uh, things just kind of click in my head when I visualize the space in between cones and uh, what a car can do. So I've kind of been pretty good at it. I try and have my courses uh, be very balanced, and that's key in this whole sport is to have balance. You don't want to have a tight course, and it's just going to favor one particular car. Uh, you want to make sure everybody has an opportunity to do well. Uh, so having said that, let's just hop into uh, some of the basic stuff. Uh, got the TV going here. Linked up to my computer, the Roger Johnson Course Design Manual is basically, for all intents and purposes, it is the Bible of what we do. Um, you got a question, you're not sure about something, I'm pretty sure there's an answer in this book. Now, it's not click and play where you can just say, hey, I've got a question, you got to actually read it and kind of do some interpretation. So, first hour or so, I'm going to read through this manual. Um, We'll try and keep questions to a minimum. After that first hour, we'll open up the floor. Let's talk about what you guys encounter, what you guys deal with in your sites. And uh, I've got a few blind course maps I gave you some. I have some extra ones from different sites in front of me. I've got a bunch of course maps that I have done myself. Here's a good stack from the last three years. It's about 300 courses that I've drawn up. About four actually were put together. But, you know, I like drawing. I have one of the best courses, uh, arguably, that's been set up in this lot. It was done on AutoCAD by Jason Frank. It's measured out to the tenth of an inch. This is no joke. This is one of the fastest, most fun it's courses we've ever had set up here. And I hold on to this because once a year we're going to build this course. So we'll all look at, over that at the end of the uh, first hour. And you know, if you have any questions or if you want to start drawing and designing in the meantime, feel free. So again, welcome. Thank you. Tri-State Sports Car Council is glad you're here. Uh, Chicago Region SCCA uh, did a lot of work for us and got us this room. And uh, earlier today, uh, several of us Tri-State members were actually setting up a course to race on tomorrow. Tomorrow is our first event. At the completion of the event, uh, we're going to go ahead and tear down the course and just bring it down to an empty parking lot again. And we're going to start a course from scratch. Anyone that's here, you're welcome to join me. Um, you're welcome to have input on it. I actually drew up a course design and we'll do some peer review before this night is over. We'll let you see what you think. If you have any concerns about the course that I drew up or if you think that uh, maybe something's a little too offset or something could be done better. That's one of the big things about doing course design. It's being open to everybody else's opinion. You don't have to take it, but you should listen to it. Uh, so, having said that, um, glad you're here. So, this is a 2016 version. I'm not sure if there's an updated one, but this is pretty much the basics. Not too much has changed in the last three years. Uh, right here is a great course that was designed for one of the national championships. This is Lincoln, Nebraska. It's a huge lot. You can do almost anything there. Uh, there's only a few places that are bad and nasty you have to stay away from. So I put my name in the hat to be selected for a national championship course designer this year. I did not get it, but I will keep applying every year until I do. And after I do get it, I will keep applying to continue to keep designing. Uh, so this book was, you know, drawn up by uh, Roger the Real, Johnson, Karen Babb, who's one of the best course designers out there. She just did Nationals last year. Greg Lee, Jim Gary, Mark Sirota. Uh, those people definitely deserve recognition. Uh, so we're going to start with the fundamentals of, uh, you know, building an autocross course. You know, avoiding all the stuff that can mess up a perfectly good course. So let's start right there. You know, you want to have a map like I gave you today. Everyone should have a map in front of you of Route 66. Some of you have relief maps that show some depression. Some of you just have a map that has a 25-foot grid of scale. Um, those are great for multiple reasons. Um, you, know, you know how big everything is. You typically don't want anything smaller than 15 feet, so a 25-foot box is a really good idea. It helps you lay out uh, what you're doing. Um, and that's if you're drawing on paper. These courses, all these PDFs that I have here, I can email all of you. If you want any uh, layouts, if any place that I have records of, I'll be glad to send them to you, and let's draw as many as we can. Uh, so the benefits of the map is, you know, to analyze the speed and safety of your design, maximize use of the course area, and accurately show corner workers their area of responsibility. 
which is very important. When you're designing a course, one of the most important things next to safety is corner worker safety. You have to remember there's going to be live human beings standing alongside. So while that cool snake maneuver that you have in the very start looks like a lot of fun, it might end up being a safety hazard if someone's running for a cone with a car coming right behind them. Um, establish the start and finish lines. It's one of the first things you do with any autocross course. You definitely want to know where your, where your, what your plan is, and the reason why you set the start and finish first, and preferably the finish first, is because safety, steward, or somebody is probably going to have a problem with it. <laughs> There's something that you didn't think about. There's a new spot in the pavement that's a hole, and now they need to move your finish five feet this way, ten feet that way. Okay, so be it. So you got to make sure that finish is up so that safety can go out there and evaluate the runoff room that you have available while you're out building the rest of the course. It's a whole team effort here. So put that finish up first, then go to your start and start laying out the cones. Uh, you know, also in part of this is making sure the trailer's in the right place where the trailer has good line sight of both start and finish. You know, you don't want to make sure, you want to make sure rather that uh, you don't have a corner worker run through the lights and you didn't see it and all of a sudden somebody's got that 10 second faster raw time and nobody caught it and all of a sudden this guy that's never been doing good, he's on top of index in the whole class. So you want to make sure that everyone in the trailer has good line of sight on both the start and the finish at all time. Uh, back to considering the placement of the course workers. Very, very important. All right? you, know, you can't have somebody with a car running at their back. Um, corner workers should always be facing traffic coming towards them. Um, so keep that very much in mind when you're building the course. Check out the conditions of the surface. One of the first things that we did when we got here this evening before setting up the course is we kind of went and took a look at the proposed uh, uh, path and uh, saw what we were up against. We ran pretty close to a couple drain holes and a couple places that were going to end up being puddles if it did end up getting nautical. Um, we don't use the R word, so nautical is what we talk about, that skywater stuff. Um, so, you know, we try to avoid those things just in case there is that opportunity that, oh man, we know this is always a puddle here. We're late in the day, the water seeps up from the ground, so we want to avoid that spot just in the off chance. So, you want to make sure that the condition of the surface hasn't changed from the last time you put eyes on it. Trust me, I was here one week and I set up a course that Jason Frank measured out to an inch. A month later, I came back to set up that exact same course. I knew it worked. It's measured out to the tenth of an inch. Everybody loved it. I'm setting up for a different club. No problem. Get here on site. I see a bunch of big orange barrels down there by the turnaround. What's that? Drive out there. There's a big crater, about a six by six foot hole in the parking lot, right in the middle of my driving line. Go over to the groundskeeper. What happened here? Oh, somebody was camping out. They drove a tent stake into the ground and found a power line. Now I have to redesign this perfect course that laid out exactly as it was drawn up and redesign it on my own right here on the fly. It worked out. I think everybody had a good time, but very much unexpected, right? So always want to check out that surface. It may have changed. You never know. Somebody might have blown up a six by six foot spot. Um, yes. The other thing when you're plotting for courses is make sure you have time and you want to allow for multiple cars on course. Now, if you've got a low count event, you know, it's not going to be as crucial that you have three, maybe four cars on course, or maybe your timing system can't support four cars on course. But you want to make sure that if you can, you want to allow for as many cars on course as possible. That way you can get as many runs as possible and you're providing a better product for your customers. So, do not, this is very, very important, do not design a course intending to get them lost or make them hit cones. Do not put too many pylons out there, cones. It creates a sea of cones. It may look all right to you in your 350Z when you're this high off the ground, but when I'm in my F modified and I'm only two feet off the ground, you know what I see? <laughs> so, sea of cones, bad. Space pylons the same distance as, uh, never space the pylons the same distance as the gate width. If you've got a 25 foot gate that you're driving cars through, you can let a bus go through there sideways, right? You don't want the next maneuver to be exactly 25 feet because then it could look askew, like well, which way am I going, right? So you want to make sure that if you've got a 15 foot gate this wide here, you don't have a similar spacing on the next element. Uh, do not place the next gate out of their line of sight. You should not have somebody coming into a turn and having to crane their neck all the way around to try and locate that next pickup cone. We had uh, a guy who would design with more than 90 degree turns on horses all the time. Mm -hmm. He about got beat up all the time and he still kept doing it. Well, you know, that sounds like something that the board should have handled. Yep. Um, so yeah, don't uh, place the next gate out of line of sight. Do not fail to line the course. Now that's when possible. 
a lot of elements take place. Uh, you know, wind can do a, a number of things, but if you do have the opportunity, if you can line the course with flour, uh, it's probably the least abrasive su uh, substance you could lay down, and even airports are not going to have any problem with you laying down flour, because wind and water will take away no problem. Uh, but line the course. It's going to prevent people from getting lost. So it's going to benefit everyone in the long run if you can just go out there, spend the three, four bucks on two big things of flour, get the spreader like they used to line a football field, and line up as much as you can to guarantee that people are not going to be lost. Make it look as much as a road course as you can. Yes, man. Especially early on when people are still walking the course. Mm -hmm. but we, we, had, we had times where, where the lining was done just before the driver's meeting. It's pretty much pointless at that point. Right, I agree. Yes, yeah, so if you're going to line the course, you definitely want to do it. That's going to be like, okay, course is open for walking. Well, uh, hopefully the guy's out there either already halfway done with lining the course yeah. or he's just getting started at the you know worst case scenario. But yes, absolutely, because it's going to help everyone visualize where you're going a lot better. Because essentially, we're setting up temporary road courses in a parking lot. It's tough to navigate through a sea of cones, especially for the first time driver. You know. <clears throat> what do you mean I go, you know, this cone's lane that way, I go this way, then that way, line it, it's going to make, okay, it makes sense in driving following the road, okay? And last but not least, do not place a cone thinking, oh boy, that's the one, the Kenny cone. The last cone in the slalom, we're going to tuck it in two feet shorter. We're going to offset it a little bit this way. It's the last cone before the finish. Everyone's going to hit it. Don't do that. So, 10 basic concepts, sorry, right. be a commercial artist. That is probably the most important thing in my mind, okay? I've driven front wheel drive cars with no power, I've driven rear wheel drive cars with a solid rear axle that'll do 90 miles an hour through pretty much every single autocross course. You don't want to design a course that's specifically for one car. All 15 foot gates, all 45 foot space pylons, repeating maneuvers that you know only certain cars can do. You know, Corvette's definitely uh, almost a foot wider than a Miata, so he's going to have to put more steering into the car to go to navigate some of these maneuvers. So you want to make sure you have good balance. You want to make sure you're designing for everyone. If you're out there saying, okay, I need to work on a slalom because I'm going to NAS next week and I really suck at slaloms. No, you shouldn't be designing a course if you're designing it for the sole purpose of your own personal test and zoom. Okay? It's not about you, it's bigger than you. Use creativity. It's, it's okay to do the same thing. Yes, David, go. Well, actually, and you know, I'm just kind of listening to Vivek Goals uh, on Autocross Talk. Uh, I know that he designs, and not, I'm not saying like not so much slums, but elements that he believes that he needs to work on and ultimately can lead to something that other people, I mean, oh, would, for sure. would need to work on. Like, uh, for example, I, I personally struggle with uh, not undefined sweepers or undefined turns. So I personally would try to include, and quite honestly, you know, it's, that involves a lot of looking ahead, and i got to have a tunnel vision when I drive, so... Well, you, you absolutely can, but you, you know... And that's perfectly fine, but again, you're designing for everyone, so you can have those, you know, that type of maneuver, but mix it up a little bit, you know, not yeah. solely that maneuver, not four of the same looks of the same entry, right. you know, mix it up a little bit. But well, you um, can and, have, and, if I'm not mistaken, uh, one maneuver where you can draw literally two separate lines, okay, uh, as far as tucking it in tight or going wide, looking for your uh, pain and payoff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Leaving room for option is definitely uh, one of the things that we're going to talk yeah, about. Yeah, I mean, I've run courses where literally the course designer is just about driven the car for the driver. And, you know, that's that takes a little bit too easy. Yeah, yeah. 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 It takes away from the challenge. Um, so, yeah, so use creativity, no hidden agendas. That kind of echoes the whole, hey, me, 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 I want to do this. Okay, so, you know, uh, be familiar with the solo course design rules. We'll go through them. They're pretty straightforward, they're short and sweet. Make the course flow. All right, you don't want to be speed up, speed up, speed up, shut it down. And speed up, speed up, speed up, shut it down. And just kind of the same thing. You want to kind of be able to carry some momentum, carry some speed. Again, we're creating mini road courses out here. So let's not uh, let be like stopping no traffic that we sit in all the time, right? Uh, use elements that favor horsepower and elements that favor handling. Again, this is all about mixing it up. Um, we'll talk about different ways to mix it up a little later on. Um, Use pointers and directionals correctly and sparingly, and also uniformly. So if you're using three cones laid down for informational purposes in this part of the course, I want you to carry on with that same three cones laid down everywhere else. If your key cone that you want people to pick up on has two laid down cones, two pointer cones on it, 
every key cone on the course needs two pointer cones laid down on it, okay? Keep it uniform. Uh, again, line the course whenever possible. Uh, and, uh, you know, number nine, place gates to avoid visual confusion. Um, that's kind of straightforward. You know, I don't want to have a really strange offset with uh, uh, pointers on both sides or something like that. Pointers should always indicate you're turning in towards the direction of the pointer cone. Uh, so if you're ever on a course and you see a pointer on the outside of the turn that is incorrect, uh, politely, kindly, let the course designer, solo chairman, or whoever's running the course that they know that, hey, that shouldn't be there. Um, and you know, and you walk and drive the course with the intent of improvement. Um, you know, it is in the rule book that you know the course has to have some flow. I believe it does state, which we'll go into, that it should be driven even um, in a non-competition car at non-competition speeds, but it, it should be driven. You know, you should at least have a look at it, at least at, you know, half speed. So you can guarantee that you're not going to have something creep up, something too far offset, something where you're going into an area where there's negative camber, but you're turning up the hill and it could possibly cause a front wheel drive rollover. You know, just certain things that you want to, you know, look at and, uh, and visualize what it's going to be like for everybody. So, you know, when you walk that course and, and when you dr drive the course, if you have the opportunity to, always be looking for, hey, what can I change differently? You know, is that visual right there in the right place? Can I shift that, that informational wall over four feet and it'll look a little better, be in my line of sight so I pick it up better on corner exit? Just little things like that. You always want to be looking to make things better. I always do. Like I said, I've designed 40 courses. I always subject my course to peer review. I take extensive notes after the fact, and I always try to learn from what I've done and improve on the next one. Uh, so going deep into these uh, topics, be a commercial artist, you know. As a course designer, I've become an artist. Uh, according to Webster, an artist is one who professes and practices an imaginative art. Believe me, imagination is required to create a course that is interesting and fun to drive. And when the course design is completed, you'll feel like you've created a piece of art. It is very rewarding. It truly is. When you hear, you're not even hearing, but when you see smiles, nothing but that big cheesy grin when people are tripping those finish lights, that's it for me. I don't got to hear you tell me my course is good. I just got to see you having a good time on it. I'm happy. You're happy? I'm happy. Um, we don't need to go into that stuff. Let's see. Set yourself up for success. All right. So the main, does the main goal of course design is to provide the competitors with fair, fun and safe competition. That's it, plain and simple. After creating the course design, take copies of it to be reviewed and critiqued by your peers and never destroy the original. I have some pretty nasty, grimy originals in here. You're welcome to look through. Some of them have beer spilled on them, but you know, it's another story. <laughs> uh, leave your pride at home. Again, you know, you're not married to the course design, you're not married to the parking lot. Please don't treat it as if somebody says you should do this, it shouldn't be a big blast on your ego, like, no, I have this measured out to the tenth of an inch and it has to work. It should work. That's Absolutely. Very good. common. Very That's common. Very common. You gotta be flexible. You, you can't don't necessarily move by maneuver. have to you don't necessarily have to jump to it and change what one person is saying, but you know what? Take it into consideration. Ask somebody else what their opinion is. Alright? Just people are telling you things for a reason. There's people that have been autocrossing for longer than me, I've been doing it for twenty years. I still take their advice. I still get my courses corrected on the morning of some things that are like, oh, oh yeah, you're right. It happens. I'm human, we all are. So listen to hear what they have to say. Ask them to explain, you know, how and why, so you understand why they want to move that cone, why that gate needs to be a little wider, why that spacing is a little off, why you're too close to that fence, which hopefully that's not an issue. Uh, and, you know, take that original map and start taking notes right alongside of it. I have notes in mind where it's like, yep, this is too fast, oh my god, that was horrible, everyone hated this turn. <laughs> that's the feedback I got, so that's what I put on the paper, and I learned a lot from that. My first course design was worse than this one. All right, so this is basically like, okay, this person has essentially, they gave their course uh, design to uh, peer review, their friends, someone in the club, and said, okay, this is what I got, what do you think? This is what they did for peer review. They kind of said, okay, you know, this, you're too close to this pole. This is a little too severe, the offset going into here. You know, just take those notes, take them back, do what you can. So after the peer review, look over and analyze your comments. Address all safety-related comments. Anything that somebody says about safety, that's your first and foremost thing. Everyone has to feel safe in the sport. Implement any that you feel that improve the design. Uh, okay, so you don't necessarily have to take their advice. Um, but be true to your basic concept. So if somebody says you should change this, but you've got your kind of own way, you know, hey, you know what, I'm always doing, you know, the three laydowns and the two pointers. You know what, I'm going to keep doing that, and that's just the uniform. 
that's your style, that's your thing, do it. You know, the great thing about the vice is you don't have to take it. You might learn or see something that you had not thought about. Uh, keep in mind the main goal of course design is to provide solo competitors, autocross customers, I would say, with fair, fun, and safe competition. Use creativity. Uh, you know, what is creativity in course design? Rewarding those with the right amount of skill, aggression, experience, and discipline. Placing the challenge in the design without making it painful or too much input density. That's a very key word there, input density, we'll talk about later. Placing chalk lines in a variety in visually interesting and helpful ways. But again, the whole idea is to direct them along the right path. Setting, setting up an often used maneuver in a different manner. Okay, everybody's using those Cheetos now, right? You got the, the V of cones. Maybe make it less severe, more rounded. You know, just a little something. Little tweaks, little differences, right? Uh, and, you know, always include a different variety of turn types and, and transitions. Um, you know, doing the same maneuver over and over, it just gets repetitive, boring, it becomes muscle memory, and, you know, if that's what somebody likes, great, but I guarantee that uh, some of the more skilled drivers are looking for that challenge uh, at every turn. So be creative and innovative, but avoid the bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> you may That's think beautiful. when you see the course tomorrow morning that he just said not bizarre. But you know what? It may look bizarre only because it hasn't been done in a very long time here. We're launching from the middle of Route 66 tomorrow. We've, we've done that a couple it, years ago, yeah. It's been a while. So to some it may look bizarre, but we walk through. You guys feel good about the back half, the first half of the course and everything? Well, actually, we are going to change a couple things tomorrow, but yes, we did drive it. We'll get to, we'll yes, get to well, go. just a few things will be changing, but yes, it's the same idea. It's going to be a little different, but it's not going to be, we're not breaking the mold, we're not reinventing the wheel. They didn't go out there and they didn't set up, you know, a double popsicle to a Chicago box or anything goofball that, you know, everyone's going to pack up their car and leave when they see it, which that's actually happened, I've seen. Uh, so, you know, avoid the bizarre, um, you know. Modify it, you know, do what you got to do. Keep it reality. The application of creativity. Uh, so, you know, you want to include turns of varying radius and speed. Sweepers should come in various sizes, possibly even with changing radii. Don't use a course design consisting of primarily 180s. Use 90s, 180s, a 60, a 45, maybe a 55, maybe a 43. <laughs> you don't even have to go with that nice rounded numbers. <laughs> Provide a variety of different car paths. Use the various turns to send cars in directions not always perpendicular or parallel to the site outside perimeter. So that means just because the curve runs this way, you don't have to run perfectly along that way. You know when you come out, right? You don't have to always run perfectly side by side. Um, provide a variety of uh, transients. So straight slums, offset slums, uh, sequence of offset gates, lane changes, combinations. Excuse me, Chris, how do you identify transient? Just so we're using the same vocabulary. Here. Yeah, I'm not sure, but I was thinking somebody the transient that just to me, the train. Transient combo. to me is moving from one maneuver to another, mm -hmm. and is there a maneuver in the middle? Okay. Uh, for me, transient is when you take, before you set up the course, and you have three, maybe four key elements. And then the transient is strictly how do you connect them, rather than an element of themselves. Hmm. Well, they're defining it as, you know. They're talking about a transient element that has lots of uh, very rapid steering input. Yeah. So it wouldn't be like a corner where you reach a, where you hold like, you know, a peak speed or, a, you know, you achieve some like lateral G, it's a, you make a turn, you quickly make another turn, you make a turn back, so a slalom. And that's, well, what that's, that's what they're mostly listing there, are all slaloms. That's transient response. But transient no, response... that's a transient element. Tran we were talking about transitions between elements, not that, that's transient That's what you're bringing up, yeah. No, for other areas are transients. All right. All right. So yeah, the, the, the gist of it is mix it up. So long and short. All right, so a couple different ideas of, you know, uh, slalom. So version A, you've got your basic 240-foot five-cone slalom, right? Version B, all we've done is we've made them into gates instead of single slalom cones. Visually, it looks completely different, but it is the exact same thing. And then again, you could do the exact same thing but have like a five-cone wall, six-cone wall. To some people that line the course wrong, if they drive the wrong line, all of a sudden those three cones look like they really pinch off that turn. They think they're going to have to jam their brakes and actually give a lot more steering input than they have, just because the cones are there. 
Okay. Version D, it's the same thing. It's just all of a sudden those last two solid cones were gated up. It's a visual uh, trick, but it, it executes the exact same maneuver. And that's when we send it up. You know, we're not reinventing the wheel. We're just giving you a little different flavor. Um, so you know, you've got the uh, your 60 foot slalom going right there. Okay, that's a little tight. Uh, I like to personally go above 60. Um, I like 65 to 80 foot slaloms myself. Um, so you know, I would do exactly what they are talking about. And right below mm -hmm. is pick up a cone. Hey, drive your Chevelle. 60's tight. 45 is the uh, is the rule. Yeah. We just 45 is the bare minimum. <laughs> 45 will have an E Street Miata crawling. For years, people thought that 45 was what a slalom had to be, and I remember there were some people is that, that I had to convince that was a minimum, not a standard. Is that what like Car and Track was doing for their basic road tests or something? something? Like that, yeah. I mean, yeah. maybe they had some logic behind it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So, you know, what you see is they've done here in the different slaloms is, you know, what they had is a 60 foot slalom. They changed it up to an increasing pace slalom, but they made it more offset. And by making it more offset while, still, while increasing the distance, it's actually going to drive almost the same as a 60 foot slalom just because you have to have that much more steering input. So, while the cones are at different spaces, the offset of them is going to make it drive almost the exactly the same. Now, in the bottom version here, what they're doing is they're going to, you can move around the cones and make the slalom either increase or decrease. Uh, you know, if you offset cones one and two the hard way, it's going to punish you. It's going to slow you down, especially the wider cars. You're going to slow down Corvettes, the cam cars, you know, all the cool cars that we like watching on the course, and the guys with the little Miatas that we all hate. They're going to fly through the, fly <laughs> through the floor, and you're going to be like, well, why are they winning on index? <laughs> so, you know, we don't want to punish too much if we can. Um, <clears throat> Before and after. Placement of the gate before and after the start and finish of a slalom is critical to the amount of turns that the slalom actually becomes. Alright, so without a gate, or with a gate in the very top, you know, it's only a three cone slalom. But if you move the way the gate is set up, it becomes a five cone slalom. So it's just a different way to look at it, and it's a way to use the same space. Chris? Yes, sir. Alright, I've uh, run into some, shall we say, negative feelings uh, on slaloms. Um, I don't, as I mentioned earlier, don't like the course designer to drive the course for the driver. Uh, and I've put up courses and people say, well, you know, why don't you force it? Well, no, I want a driver to have the option as to which line he takes. There may be a significant benefit in my Miata going to the inside and Chris's, you know, Chevelle going to the outside based on the exit. So if you have an even, as I think, you know, if you've got an even number of cones in the slalom, you're going to enter and exit on different sides. Mm -hmm. If you've got, you know, odd number, yeah, you're going to enter and exit on the same side. So there is a reason for, you know, a hard way, as you said, to get into or mm -hmm. out of, and then the, the easy way to go on the other side. For sure. Now, I've had people say, well, that's not the way they do it at nationals. Well... Uh, you can still have a national caliber course, okay, but we haven't got the facilities that nationals have, no, we right? Uh, nor, you know, the, the environment just isn't there. We haven't got the size, and we're a region. We're not national, okay? So, and particularly Tri-State. The only SCCA rules we are compelled uh, to follow are the safety rules. The rest we can do whatever the heck we want. Doesn't make any sense for us to, but we could. Uh, so I would like to find out your feeling on the forced and open slalom. Well, uh, for me personally, the last time that I set up uh, what I consider an optional slalom, that's what we're talking about, right? So yep. you go on either side. The last time I set up an optional slalom, I had three or four people come up to me at the end of the day and be like, you know the only person that went the wrong way into the slalom? Oh, yeah. That was <laughs> on my own in course. In Peru. In Peru. I'm like, so oh, I'm like, I took the really fun cool. way. I took the one that had an extra <laughs> turn, right? It worked out well. It cost me about 30 spots on index. But, you know, so uh, 
You know, again, I, I like to take out the guesswork, you know. Um, yes, I, I understand at a higher level, like a national tour or something, I, I personally would probably throw a natural slalom in because someone like myself can even get confused on their own course, right? So it's possible. But for local, I want everyone to get up to speed. I want everybody to be on the same team. I want everybody to be as best as they can be with the best opportunities so they can push everyone else so we can all get better as autocrossers. Steel sharpens steel. So I want to take the guesswork out of it personally. Now, but the what, what, what you can do, like I know you're designing the courses here for us, Bob. You're welcome to do it. We have no, there's no rule against that. You're welcome to make an optional song for two of them. Make one offset for me, though, please. <laughs> right? Done. All right. So, you know, what's easiest to see here, right? There's different ways to look at a slalom, right? So, looking at it from above when you're looking at it on your paper is completely different to how it's going to look at when you're in a car, right? So, this is how we can end up in trouble with the sea of cones. Uh, so you just get kind of a different look. Paper in the car, paper in the car, paper in the car. The dreaded Chicago box, it's just a slalom disguised, okay? So looking at it on the right picture, it's a sea of cones, and that's kind of what it's for. It's meant to scare people. Now, if you turn it on an angle and make it a truly painful maneuver, you're going to lose a customer, too. It's also meant to be, it's not technically a slalom, so they can make it shorter than 45 feet, which no. is the original intent of it. That, nope. that, that has been, that's not true no. anymore. Co cones in a line that resemble a slalom are to be considered a slalom. Yes. That's which means right. they've got to be 45 feet. That was originally. That's why it was invented. And yes. That's why it was used. But that's it's why not, you don't see it's it not allowed anymore. But now. Because now it's just a slalom. It's just a slalom. And it's just but a you can use, a you can use the Chicago box as a visual element to, um, um, not to confuse people, but to uh, to make it uh, like if you do a slowdown before a finish or something like that. Yeah, I mean, if, if you angle it, it's tech. I mean, well, but but what I'm but saying is, you don't make it a, a you don't you don't have to make it painful. It's just no. a a visual thing that you know. Mm -hmm. Here's the Chicago box. That's what I have to do here, right? I personally like the maneuver uh, because of the visual, you know. Cues. I, I like it, but I also hate it because it if you tag small. this first cone, yeah. it always true. drives that way. You yeah, tag this first cone on the way in, that could take out two more cones going that way. So now you've got workers running, scrambling. Do they have enough cones to reset the box? Um, so that's you know another thing we'll talk about a little later on is you know, can you do it? Sure. Is it a great maneuver? Absolutely. Visual visual miscues, legal one, perfectly great. Is it going to slow down your event? <laughs> then just your general over, I mean, how, how much work do you want to give yourself at setup? How much work do you want to give yourself at cleanup? Because ultimately, yeah. at the end of the day, you know, you're... Oh, so, for, for me personally, <laughs> if you, make it painful, you could do the same maneuver, take out these four cones right in the middle, and just open up the box. We'll talk about that in a second. Yeah, but that'll just, just make it look bigger. It, it's just an element. You're just trying, trying to throw something in there. We... It, at the Porsche Club, we do these all the time. We actually think they're funny because people hate them, and, and we actually enjoy messing with the Chicago box. We'll make them longer, and the center cone will actually make a small wall. Offset. So it's literally yeah. you have to dog leg in, make a small shoot, and dog leg back out. Yeah. So we're stop. making it. It's the bus stop. Yeah, bus yeah, stop. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> and we we just have fun. But here's the thing. We'll run the course, whoever's setting up the course does the course with their car, and we're, we're often, are constantly modifying, moving, chalking, pulling things out. We'll run it, and if we see a group is constantly hitting something, we're like, okay, this may be a little too tight or a little too narrow, and we'll move the damn thing in the middle of the run. We don't care. We're there just to have fun. You know? Now, you guys are a little more competitive, and you guys are more <laughs> point markers. Ours is easy. You hit a cone, you're out. Because we don't have time to count and we don't have the fancy computers. <laughs> hit a cone and get after you're done. So, awesome. so we want you to not have a dirty run. So we'll run it and all of a sudden we're like, you know what? This sucks. Let's move the cones. We don't care. We just want to have fun. And we, and we like this. I, I like the point of it is we want to have fun. Yeah, that's it. That's, what, like that's what we're here for. That's what it's all like, about. Like how you said, you move the back wall. Yeah, we've done that so many times. Yeah, pull it out. It's usually for the guys with the Corvettes, though. 
Yeah, so you can let that tail wag when they, you know, lock yeah, up that left front, uh, pitch it back. Yeah. You didn't have to go wrong, or you didn't have to get it. All right, so the dead wrong is the end. The dead wrong. The wrong, of course. Yeah, there's no more wrong. The problem also is the line of cones over there. You still get somebody does go through the line. In our club, we've dragged them along. That's true. Really, you said D and F like this. We don't drag. But then you're chasing all the way in. You never come back. Right. What comes a problem with line of the end of the stack that our worker stations between five and ten cones for the station. So there's always going to be a couple with the hopes that you know, either we don't get too many that blow apart, which on cold days they can absolutely just disintegrate, or uh, get dragged back to grid. Because yeah, that one ain't coming back really. That's something we really never have. Piles of a couple extra clones. Right? Yeah, throw like five clones out in the corner. Like few. Yeah, Unless he wants to talk about the crushed ones, because we had a mountain of those at one time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How about those blobs that you pulled off of somebody's catalytic converter? <laughs> oh, yeah. All right, so back to the class here. All right, the brainer. All right, this is kind of what I was just talking about here. All right, so we're going to talk about this maneuver. The wall at the end of the 180 is unwary competitor. Uh, they're going to be scared looking at it, right? They're going to shut it down more than they have to. You pull that wall out, and now they can see that they can actually take that turn. Now, someone with all the horsepower in the world, he's going to go in there and point and shoot anyway, but someone with no horsepower, they're really going to love the fact that they can actually carry a lot more speed and arc that out a lot more, because on entry over here, you should be picking up this cone over there for your uh, exit point. So having that lack of wall there is really going to turn that from what looks like a painful two-turn 180, uh, or two 190s rather, into a nice gradual 180. Um, and then, you know, same thing over here on the, on the brainer that's on the right here, where you set up, you know, the key cone is all the way on the back side, okay? This is what I would call a t essentially a sucker cone. I put that cone there and hope that you drive at that cone. Somebody that drives cone to cone, they're going to go in there, they're going to have to shut the car down so much to make this turn. Whereas the brainer, the guy that knows how to read the line, is going to set up a little wide right here. He's going to carry, he's going to be off of this cone, he's going to sacrifice that cone to be on top of this cone to carry more speed into the straightaway out of here. All right, and that's just the way that you, know, you want to set up the course so that you know, some people are going to go cone to cone. But you know, but you know that the deadline is not the correct one? Well, it depends on what car. After that. Which car in SSE? If, if there's a straight after that, that's not the correct line. Because you, you, you're sacrificing too much distance and speed going wide. If you take that tight, um, because the, the problem is you're coming out of that, you're not, go, you're not going at max your velocity lateral or, or, mm -hmm. or in, in your, in your uh, acceleration line. So by sacrificing the first turn, you're losing more time than you make up later on. Well, I can't, uh, I can't defend the, uh, the graphics here. So, but the the gist no, but I of it think is, is, it, is it, I think what Chris is saying though is like yeah. if you if you just play it really tight on those two cones and you drive from right. straight at that cone, sure that, yeah. that apex is going to be so tight right. you right. never make it right. If, if I if Whereas, I try to line from here to here, I'm going to wash out and I'm going to be all the way on the yeah, outside. Yeah, you're going to here. Gonna be in a horrible I'm going to be spot. over here as opposed to in here where I can get a good run. So it's not. You can be tight on that, but you got to have the right approach to it to right. be tight. But this is sacrificing the first turn. A little bit. Well, you're oh. talking about sacrificing distance. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes it's better to take that distance out so you can carry some speed through. It's a tough call. Yes. It depends yeah. on, first of all, it depends on how fast you're going into that turn to begin with. And the, and the point of the maneuver is already present because we're all sitting here arguing about which is the fastest way. So you know, you know that that is a good, you know, that's the brain. It, that's the brain. you got to yeah. think about it. Yeah, you know, you what works if you got 500s may not work turn, in a Corvette How much time are you going to spend in there? The other, okay. other good thing, of course, you have with that maneuver is that, or that oh, element is that someone who's driven, driving cone to cone can still make it through. A novice yeah. can go through there just fine sure and can. drive the course. Whereas, I think, like, the idea is that someone who's more skilled, more advanced, and it can go, hmm, there's, better ways there's some thinking right? here. All right, so no hidden agendas. You know, I kind of beat this to death earlier. I don't want to really touch base on it too much, but, you know, you know, make sure you mix it up. You know, you don't want to have 1,000 foot straightaways. Basically, anything over 400 foot uh, straightaway or more is bad. Try and get around 275. That's normally a nice happy zone. 
All right, so, uh, you know, be familiar with the soil course design rules. Want to take a second and go over the rules? All right. I did not give these to you, unfortunately. Um, but these are all linked up. I pulled these off the interwebs on my personal electronic device. Um, but I'm just going to read from it. I can put it up on the screen if you prefer. Nobody want the course? The, just the words on the screen. Do you have that presentation printed? No, you can find it online. No. Yes. I, I, do have, I do have one copy that I was going to read from in case the screen started melting my eyes because I don't yeah. work with computers. But I'm doing all right so far. Okay. Um, so if you absolutely want it, you're, you're welcome to it because I typically will. I'll read this pretty much cover to cover before I drop any course design just to refresh my memory. I also look at some of my favorite Oh, so is this just the Roger Johnson A to, a to Z? Yeah, this is straight oh, off of Google. The, Google yeah, Roger Johnson course okay. design manual. This is the first right. PDF that came up. Okay. All right, so of course, I'm going to read the rules word for word here. Solo courses should be open enough to allow good competition between larger and smaller cars and should emphasize high speed, power to weight ratio, extreme maneuverability, memory, or visual acuity. Regional, national tour, and national championships events shall be conducted on a paved surface. Pretty much anywhere is on a paved surface, otherwise they call it rally cross. <laughs> All right, uh, so... So, yeah, sorry, jumping ahead. Uh, so common sense and solo courses. Although solo events are non-speed events under the solo rules, speed alone is not the operative factor in determining what is and is not a proper solo event. Hazard is the operative word. Hazards must not exceed those encountered in legal highway travel. Generally, maximum speeds in the mid-50s to mid-60s are, are contemplated for street and street touring vehicles. So that means if you've got a course where somebody's hitting 70 in a street car, your course might be a little too fast according to the rule book. Uh, there are some exceptions. These must be observed. Since these are speeds with which the average driver is familiar from everyday road driving, but it is quite possible to set up a course in which speeds do not exceed 45 miles per hour that is more hazardous than a course that has a 65 mile per hour speed max. Okay? Same sort of reasoning must be applied to cornering speeds. If, for example, there are two identical 30 mile per hour tunes, one bordered by a 50 foot drop off or a solid row of trees, and the other by a 50 foot flat obstacle free <coughs> asphalt, the hazards involved are much different. The former is clearly not permissible in an SCCA solo event, and the latter clearly is. So, 50 feet from a drop off or trees, a little bit rough. Uh, each event chairman is cautioned to remember that entrants and workers must be SCCA members in solo events, or they are not covered by catastrophic insurance. Furthermore, by definition, a solo event is open to a total novice in any car that can pass safety tech inspection, and courses must take this into consideration. So yes, you may have a Fiat 500 A bar show up. You may have a Ford Fiesta show up. Keep that in mind. Those cars are rollover hazards, in case I don't know. All right. Um, it would be possible to set the extremely strict and rigid limits on solo events regarding speed and/or course dimensions. However, it is not the intent of these rules to outlaw event sites which cannot accommodate a course of certain stated dimensions or create the impression that. So long as some magic speed limit is not exceeded, these rules are adhered to. Basically, solo event speeds are limited to what is reasonable and prudent for the conditions encountered, subject to the constraint that top speeds be within an allowable range as described in section 2.2. That means Route 66, we're a drag strip, heading down to that turnaround, we've got over 500 feet of runoff room. So if your car does peak over 70 miles per hour here at Route 66 going in the right direction, it's fine, it's in a safe area. Laying out a course to comply with the safety requirements of these rules call for the exercise of prudent, good judgment, and common sense. Failure to say may subject an SCCA region to severe sanctions. All right. Now we can cherry pick the rest of this stuff. All right, so. <clears throat> yeah, okay, so. All right, so courses must be tight enough so that cars can run the entire course in their lower gears. 
Speeds on the straight stretches should not normally exceed the mid-60s for the fastest street and street touring cars. The fastest portions of the course shall be those most remote from spectators and property. Terms should not normally allow speeds in excess of 45 and underprepared cars. It must be remembered that sites themselves vary and not all sites will safely support the speeds shown in these guidelines. Conformity to these speed guidelines does not preclude reasonable and prudent consideration of the conditions encountered. And then it goes into guidelines on cornering speeds, which I would highly recommend that somebody was, uh, if you were interested, you would definitely want to take a look at that and read through them. There are great graphs in there that kind of tell you what cornering speed, lateral Gs, and the turn radius will do for you. So, having said that, we're now kind of familiar with the rules, right? Oh, I didn't touch base on the most important things. If you have carts, junior carts, little children that don't have driver's licenses and go-karts, your course cannot come within 50 feet of any solid object. That's a pole, that's a K-rail, uh, that's anything that sticks up more than a couple inches from the ground, including a curb. So, curbs are not so considered solid. Curbs, I know. They, they can be fudged to the 25, but I say for carts, it's 50. Our cart stewards are going to say 50. Let's just play it safe with 50 <clears throat> on those, just because. I know if you hit a uh, curb in a cart, you get ejected from the flaming carcass because you're not strapped in. Uh, but still, let's just give them more than enough room to run off. We have the room here at Route 66. Maybe your site does not. Well, maybe your site uh, it shouldn't allow junior <clears throat> carts. We also don't have curbs. Maybe that too. So, <laughs> uh, 75 feet from uh, spectators. You can't come within 75 feet from spectators. There should be a barrier between spectators and the course if possible. Uh, we're very fortunate here that we have these big railings that uh, Route 66 has that helps us police a little bit. Uh, but, you know, that's a big no-no is being within 75 feet. And the same goes uh, for when you're spectating uh, anywhere on the site. Some sites you may not be able to get away with spectators. I think we may encounter that later this year with the speedway on the other side. All right, so there it is. The course boundary should not pass within 25 feet from solid objects. And that's regular cars, no carts. 25 feet. Same goes for uh, the grass line. You know, if you got grass, grass tends to you know, have cars accelerate when they hit the grass. There's significantly less friction between the tire and grass than there is between the pavement or asphalt. So uh, keep at least 25 feet from grass as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 50 feet of carts kind of gives you a couple of ideas of, you know, having a turn going into a uh, cement curb area or near a light pole, you know, just a couple of visual things that uh, you want to stay away from. Uh, special caution should be applied when negative camber turns are used. A lot of sites, drainage, everything is graded. You want to be careful that you're not uh, turning the wrong way, going uh, up on the off camber side can uh, definitely cause part of rollover. These diagrams do a good job of kind of explaining that. Let's see. Oh, there's a fun course with a crossover. We'll talk a little bit about crossover since I've got the screen up right here. Uh, crossovers are fine. Try and get it done in the first 20 seconds of the course. Get it over and done with. You don't want to have a crossover at the finish. You could, uh, somebody goes too slow through the first half of the course. Somebody's Johnny Hotfoot coming up behind him. All of a sudden, oh, hey, you've got the old figure eight head on collision going on down there. So crossover, if you need to use one for your site, great. Um, you know, try and get it done uh, early, over with, and make sure it's safe for workers. Um, and, real, and real quick thing about crossover is, uh, their a their best benefit is typically on smaller sites like uh, Boomer Stadium mm -hmm. or possibly Sears Center. And if you to do it early on in the course, the thing about that is, uh, not only do you save yourself from getting a a bad situation towards the finish, but also uh, you could also kind of use that as your marker for when to start the next car if, you're, if you have starters that are great point. Just use one counting. So yeah, so um, yeah, there's, there's nothing wrong with them. Uh, they're legal. You know, even if you've got a small site, I know that in some places uh, they they have to run like a two lap course. They can only have one, maybe two cars on course. But you know what? If that's what they have to do to put on a good product for their customers and they keep customers coming back, what you got to do? You know, it's all about uh, growing the sport. Uh, so let's see what we got here. Yeah, we've got the old choker turn at the end of 150 foot straight. That's, you know, that's kind of bad. But if you kink it out, you know, the bad better right here. 
kind of the same thing. You've got just got a good run at it. You got to kick it out a little bit, but now it's not such an abrupt, hard right turn. The back end of that box is open on the set on the picture to the right of it, so it's uh, it's going to drive a lot better. It's going to look a lot better, and it's going to uh, reward you as the course designer a lot better. Uh, same thing in the next uh, picture over there. You know, just visualize everything. You know, a sharp turn following a high speed entry. It's going to be bad. You know, you want to make it a little more gradual. You don't want to come out that last slalom cone and have to pitch it all the way over again. You can just let the car rest, let the suspension settle a little bit before you start diving back into the next maneuver. Everyone is going to be happier with that. Um, you know, cars on course, you know, you got to be 75 feet from uh, the other half of the course. You know, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, especially with the maneuver they have going right here, you get somebody that locks up their brakes or something, they blow through the back of that wall. You're 50 feet from some car that's on the other half of the course, and now you got a good T-bone situation. The event's shut down, and uh, oh wait, you got to do a lot of paperwork, I think. Uh, so yeah, uh, one side of the course to the other, 75 feet, if possible. If not, space cars uh, up appropriately. Make the course flow. There's no such thing as a car that can turn on a dime. Pretty straightforward. Uh, it's not necessary to get into third gear in order to have fun. It's not necessary to be at the top of second gear either. It is necessary to get out of first gear. <laughs> you definitely want to get out. I don't care if you've got a Corvette that does 50 in first gear. If you're in first gear for the whole course, no. Straighten something out. Pick up a cone somewhere. Uh, the level of fun is more determined by the flow of the course instead of the highest speed attained. Uh, you feel like you've gone fast without violating the speed paired to gyms and your design is a success. So what is the flow of the course? Flow returns to the way that the adjacent section of the course connect to one another. All right. Think about it like water flowing down the river, right? You know, you hit that rock and it's going to jump out. But if you set up a little bit for it and you weave around, it's going to flow nice and smooth. You should have the same characteristics, basically. All right, ways to make a course flow is to be able to accurately determine the flow of a course before you set up. You must be able to first draw a scale map. All right, again, I have a lot of sites in my computer. If you have access to them uh, from your home sites or if you want our sites, get in touch with me. I'll give you my email before we leave here tonight. Or you can just email board at Tri-State. We'll get them out to you. Um, you know, the more information that you have going into uh, a new site or to set up a course, the better. Um, relief maps, scale, if you can get in there the day before, look at it. Great. You know. um, if, you, if you go to Google Maps and and you get a right click or something like that, you can actually measure out a space too. Very helpful, very helpful, especially if you're out there hunting for new sites. <coughs> yeah. um, also, ideally for any of those uh, who, are, who are CAD doers, um, something that can also be beneficial is if you can get that Google image, uh, you can import it into one of your CAD systems and that would also be ideal in helping you with your spacing. <coughs> And that's another good point. We'll come to it a little bit. CAD designing and uh, old school designing. I'm an old school guy. I use paper, pencil and paper still. Um, it gives me wiggle room. You know, when I'm drawing with a on a scale map with a pencil, every cone that I put down is about the size of a Mini Cooper. So I know I can move about five feet in any direction. I still got some plenty of wiggle room, right? But the key is just make sure that flow is there, right? I want to be able to string it. I want to visualize going from one maneuver to the next without severe harshness. Uh, so locate the key cones in design. Determine which cones control the speed and direction of the course. And remove any of the remaining cones that could cause confusion. Remove a solemn cone in a 45 to 55 foot solemn. Please make it a little bigger, a little faster. Everyone will be happier. Uh, allow a few more feet of width and or length when approaching the next maneuver. Give them room for option. When you see the course that we have set up tomorrow, a couple of the turn entries, you could go through there completely sideways in a school bus. That's like that for a reason. And so you can take your line, or you have enough rope to hang yourself with. All right, I give you the option of driving all the way out of here and using all this space to arc it however you want. Maybe that's the right way, maybe there's a better way. Maybe every car is different. So giving them room to, room to move and option to do what they want, as opposed to forcing them to drive the proper line. The biggest key of this sport is being able to read a course and find the line and knowing how to drive the line. And if you can't figure that out while walking the course, you know, and it takes a few runs, it's, you know, it's a, little a little more difficult. Um, so anyway, let's see, where were we? Avoid painful walled-in turns. You know, you don't want to have uh, 
at the end of the straight, one pin cone, and then the, the gate on the outside is 15 feet only, the bare minimum. So, oh my God, I mean, you better be on the brakes way back here so you can make that super tight turn. Um, so, you know, try to leave them room to, for option. Don't wall off any turns, force them to drive a line. Ensure the next gate is visible, at least in your peripheral line of sight. Even when we go in here, we always have a typical, what we call the turnaround here at Route 66. It's pretty tight. Uh, I think at most we can do about 215, maybe 220 inside radius for a turn back there. And still at that, when you come into the turn, you're still craning your head over. You do not have to go all the way over, but when you enter that turn, it's big, and you're locating your next pickup cone, and it's about, oh, a little more than 50 degrees to your, to your right, so about 330. So you want to make sure it's there. If I had the next cone that you want to pick up another 30 feet down the road, it would be that much more looking and that would be visually painful for the next guy. So you want to make sure the next gate is visible, at least in your peripheral. Move a limiting or constricting gate one or 10 feet to open up the approach. Again, choked entries, choked exits, they mean for no option and it's you know, one, right, one, right, one right way only and that's no fun. Maneuvers to avoid. These are big. Off camber turns, especially right turns. You're going right, driver's on the left, all the weight's over there, front wheel drive car especially, that's a bad one. Uh, don't use decreasing radius right turns, especially sharp ones. All right, so that means you're coming into a turn that's wide open and it's choked off on the exit and you're just trying to get in there too much and again, it's a high center of gravity rollover hazard. Avoid one, two hard corrections following a fast section. So that mean like if you had a uh, 75 foot pace slalom and then you had like another 80 feet and you had a gate that's five feet this way and another 50 feet and then you had a gate that's 10 feet that way. Well that's super abrupt and that's gonna be the old Scandinavian flick test. You finish the slalom, you come up this way and you gotta yank that wheel back this way and hope that back end stays behind you and if not, you're gonna roll the car. So try to avoid those, you know. We want to shave the speed off on the way in. Yes, we know this is a car control place, but a lot of people get what we call red mist. You give them the opportunity to use the throttle and they will. Uh, it may not be the right thing to do, but they will. If they see the open space, they're going to gas it. Uh, there are a lot of no fun maneuvers. There are more than I see here, but let's just talk about some serious no fun maneuvers. If you ever have a turn that requires you to downshift into first, get rid of it. That's not fun. Uh, there's no synchro in any manual transmission that'll properly line up the gears going from second into first. So you run the risk of chipping teeth or doing worse damage to the inside of a transmission downshifting into first gear. That is a fact. 360 degree pivot turn, spin cones. Not a fan? Narrow, walled in sharp turns. We just talked about that. You don't want to have everything at the bare minimum 15 foot spacing. Gates or slums with severe offset or short spacing. 45 foot slalom with 10 to 10 foot offset. I'm packing up my car and going home. Two 90 degree walled in turns shaped like a Z. This actually happens more often than you think, but as long as you do it in the first half of the course, it's all right. Okay, it's not the worst thing. Everybody's car can physically make a complete U-turn in less than 50 feet, I believe. 50 foot radius is very reasonable. So, if you're going to do something like that, try and get it over in the first part of the course. And also with those Z-type formations, that also becomes a worker safety thing because now you've got a car that's going to overlap and come back at you twice if you're standing on the inside of this car. Um, and, you know, the other no fun maneuver, which is a real bad one, is, is jamming on those brakes before the lights. All right? That is something that some people will try and sneak through without hitting the brakes. It could create a bad situation really fast. So... Ideally, we like to have lots of runoff for our finishes, and we like to have you on the throttle through the finishes at our courses here at Route 66, and when we work at Peru, and any other sites that we plan to go to. We want it to be safe, fast, straight acceleration. Last thing you've got on the trip to lights is have your hands shaking. Like, yes. <laughs> got <to do> right? <laughs> All right, so talking a little bit about key cones. You know, the key cones are the ones that, you know, you actually have to, to maneuver around. The other ones are just visual cues, right? Or visual nightmares. So, I don't need to go too deep into that. Gate width versus speed. 
So yeah, I mean, you could open up the back side of a turn or something to increase speed. You know, just kind of some of the things that he has in the book here. Again, I'll give you the link for this book. We're not going to go too deep into a lot of this stuff. Um, you know, you got a tight slalom and it's really slow. It's really easy to pick that one cone up like you're showing here. The steady 45 pace slalom, that's that's Miata Club stuff. No offense if you're a Miata Club guy, but only Miatas can really do a 45 foot slalom well. Um, so, you know, it's better to actually pick up that cone and then do something like they show below with the increasing slalom or even just pick up one cone and make it a steady pace 50 foot slalom. Just that little extra space is going to help out anybody with a car wider than a Miata. Lock to lock turns, that's, you know, you don't want to do that. You, you know, we're not a drift club. Um, none of us are. We don't like those drifters anyway. They go slow. So let's try and keep it off the lock. We don't want to have people like, man, I need more toe out. I couldn't make that turn. I drive an FCON on some of these turns I can't physically make. Uh, there's the painful Walden turns. We touch base on that. We're not going to beat it to death here. But, you know, you kind of see the difference of the, uh, the two betters on the uh, top and, uh, and the bottom. They're all executing the exact same maneuver, just a different way of looking at it. So, again, these are highly recommended uh, learning tools. You know, this is basically all we've got now is going to be a lot of maps here. So if you like, I don't think there's too much that we really need to cover here that's going to get you up to speed with the basics. So why don't we go ahead and take like a five-minute break, five-minute break, stretch your legs, grab a drink, water fountain in the hall. Um, and then let's go ahead and let's talk about, you know, what you guys want to talk about. Let's, let's get all about your, crosses, uh, your courses, and if you have any questions, let's go ahead and get that doing. A little after six, that's about an hour's worth. Smoke ready to go? I live in like your neighborhood. You live just south of me, yes. I, I, I saw you. I drive through your neighborhood every day. I noticed. I figured that out. Yes, uh, father in law. There you go. I don't like it. Okay. It's all full. Well, you know, as an auto tech, I took me out. This stuff, so this is like for him to make video footage. Well, well, so it's changed. I just want to change. You don't have to do it. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. Yes, I do. Hey, oh, wow. You want to do it? Yeah. 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 Y
for the second time, the second time, you have a 13 or 14 year old girl playing the sound box on it. Like, so long ago. So much. This is before I was an SCCA member. I was like, this is the right girl. I mean, I'm in the fourth focus at the first year. Like, this is the right girl. And I did the last couple of years. So, I didn't know. We enjoy our are you telling me because you suck? People are like, oh no, that turn sucks. You want me to bring in the outside? You want me to bring in the outside? I think the outside is like, as I said, it's no fun. Some people are like, that one point sucks. And we're diving in, and the first thing that's small, you're right? So you just gotta throw them in the corner and then they can get them down, right? But sometimes it just sucks. So you just have to talk to those people. I know you were going to show how I did it. I drew one of your ones. I tried to do a uh, sketch up or sketch up or something. I tried to do all these uh, these things online, these free programs. I'm like, I call my daddy for plugins. Like, you, you, you got like plugins for cars and people and trees. And I'm like, I don't know what to do with this. So I got pissed off and I really just colored pencils on my own. Of course, I had not like it. And I drew it to what made sense to me because I knew the drama that you guys were not in the end club showing up all about. And, and I took this book. Yeah. And when I drew my course, I said, I want this on the then all the said, It's on page 53. And I grabbed page. And I had a book because I was told there's a new book on the and set up. I'm like, oh my god, that's awesome. So I had a whole copy of the big man. And then I had everything elements, like this element 3, this element 4, and then this element 4 is on page 56. It's on the back. And they're looking at it going, wow, okay, I get it. It's like, oh, okay. It's kind of like, it's kind of like, it's kind of like, it's kind of like, but if you took that and you said, okay, I have to just try to do this, and I got to think of the picture of the house and the book saying, here's what you're trying to set up, just get away from it. And then they're asking, oh, why do you think it is the big? And they're like, really? Like, this is carrying for us in the house. The next one is like, whoa, you almost got me that guy. That's the red one here. Okay, it's cool. I didn't know this thing at the end. So you're reducing the radius and then you're kind of the first one stop or something. Unfortunately for this part where this was, it was like two thirds of the white for the width. And then from the like, oh, you're he's like, I need a parachute to stop the box. I'm like, how long do you want the box? We made the box like two times longer. <laughs> and he's still complaining. And people, people still complain with him because. They figured out what the hell they did from the other turn was, and then the slack is short and the turn. They were way to hell out of here. As much as they got hammered down. And literally, they're just, I mean, when you talk about confident, I mean, they were just flying. Because now they got it. <laughs> and we did it on purpose. We did it for the scratch house. But it's also we had so much we tend to have to assuage the illness is not yeah. easy. No, no, you gotta have thick skin. You really gotta have thick skin. Oh, they're all like, who drew this? Who was I am drew? Just in the first part. I remember Daryl told me a long enough sentence at the end. We'd get in to the game of art. Two guys in the back. Pick it up all the time. That looks good. They're probably just in the back. Well, it's good. And then when you know the show, Death Drag is a challenge. Yes, yes, we do that. We do that. Now we've got the wagons. Just let it go. Yeah, all day. 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 Yeah, all day.
cats there are in different cars. I always have been playing for you guys for my after some search. I know that's because it's two guys Recording. Lots of time left, too. Got two close to the edge. Bell long. 
things I do is I take blank piece of paper and I draw with pencil and paper on my course. So I've got a blank route 66 map. I gave you all some that are similar. Mine has a couple spots that I know to avoid. A lot of them I know from repetition to avoid. Uh, but the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out a pencil and I'm going to actually just kind of figure out what I think a road course should be in this particular situation. So just pull that pencil and start sketching. It took me a few tries. I actually uh, made a few versions. I drew one course map in about five minutes and I sent it over to my friend Pete who just left, who's one of my confidants. And uh, I made it a stinker. I, I made it pretty bad. And I wanted to see what he would say intentionally. So you can go ahead and pass that around. Uh, again, I drew that in five minutes, maybe ten. Uh, it's got severe issues. I kind of uh, wrote them on there. But that's kind of what it started with. Um, just a design. Similar to something I did last year, but with uh, less strict spacing. So it didn't work out exactly as I anticipated. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I started to make it worse and worse and see what oh, Pete told me after the fact. Just a test tip. Okay. So um, me, uh, I use one of these. I've got a map. In my map, I've got a little scale there that tells me exactly how far 100 feet is on this particular piece of paper. Some of the ones I printed out for you have 25 foot boxes, so you just find something like a ruler that matches off, and you're off and counting. 
Uh, first, I start laying out my cones after my initial design of where I want my course to flow. And then I'm going to start placing my cones. And then I'm going to go and start measuring where I actually put those cones. And then I'm going to make revisions and I do a lot of erasing. And I go through and I erase probably about half the cones that I initially had on there. And I'm work left with something that's completely different and new. And then when it's all is said and done, I do myself a big favor, which I wish David didn't leave because he really needed to hear this. I map off the course so I can walk with a walking wheel that measures that spacing, and I can just walk and drop a cone. So right off the bat, I'm starting at 280 feet from the back wall. From there, I'm gonna go 30 feet straight east, and then 30 feet to my left, and that's my first cone. Then I'm gonna go 140 feet in that same direction, and then 65 feet to the right. And so I'm just going to literally walk it with a walking wheel in a straight line. Here's my 145 feet. Oh, now I'm going to go 65 feet this way in perfectly straight lines, and I'm going to drop those cones. The course, if you do it like that, will lay out fast. If you haven't measured out to the quarter of an inch, tenth of an inch, it's going to lay out real fast. So it makes your life easy. Out of curiosity, and I, I once thought about this, especially nowadays with our accuracy of our phones and this and that. Mm -hmm. Does anybody... Once you get the cones set up for future reference, we can lay down the course. Do we have anything, or has anybody done it that you know of that has gone up to the point, click, get it down so that you can actually go and somehow set it down with one person without counting it out, but you've got some kind of a instrument, GPS, how tight they can get now, and you can actually drop it? Has anybody We haven't done gotten this? that far yet, no. I was, I was thinking about this the last year, and I wondered how it can do. Phone GPS, the accuracy is only if you had a, um, the the fresh way that uh, it's yeah. moving, it's not that accurate from day to day. Yeah, so I didn't know if there's a, you know, if I could think of it, I hope somebody does figure this out kind of thing, because then one person go in, that'd be nice, and it could drop right down the spot mm -hmm. if you have a, something set up already. So now, this piece of paper I'm passing around now, this is the course that I designed, and I figured this is going to be good enough. This is close enough to exactly how the course is going to lay out tomorrow. Uh, but I want everyone to look at this. If you've got a piece of paper and a pen, take some notes. If you have something that you want to address, uh, all my cones that are keyed are numbered. So go ahead and write down that key number and uh, tell me what you think about the course. So go ahead, take a few seconds, pass on to the next guy. I'll keep chatting about other fun stuff. But, you know, let's make this our course tomorrow. All right, I designed the basics of it. I know what the lot is like. I know what we can and can't get away with, and that's pretty close. There are some tweaks that can and should be made. Um, but I want to see what everyone else in here thinks. Just kind of like I gave Pete the old test yesterday. Somebody asked about a test. Well, now you got it. Right, Matt? <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so, you know, that's kind of how I do things. I'm a pencil and paper guy. There's no wrong way. There's no right way. Um, you get better with repetition. I'm sorry. I thought you had a thing. Nope. You get better with repetition. You know, I learn. Every time I design a course, I learn. That's why this notebook is ever growing here. And it's just like a, there's five iterations of almost every course that I made. I even have one of the first course designs that I made with David Fincham here. And I, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. I have five, six really bad comments written down. <coughs> I thought it was all right. Just kidding. It was a horrible course. Um, I've got other courses that I've done here. Lots of different sites. Um, so, does anybody have any questions? Uh, you know, do you have any uh, comments? Anything for me? You got any, something about your site? Yeah, something you want to work with or talk about? Don't everyone jump at once? <laughs> Are there rules for corner stations? how far apart they need to be? Or? No, but uh, all right, so let's go back and let's talk about, uh, I'll, I'll get into that in just a second, but let's talk about input density. Uh, input density is how many turns you're actually putting on the steering wheel throughout the course of the event, or the course, course the course, course the course. Um, so, and with that, you know, like I did the course that's being passed around that I'm saying is gonna be the course tomorrow, I counted out about 26 inputs. 26 inputs on what's going to be right around a 55 to 60 second course in an H Street car. That's about right. If I was up in the 30 inputs for that same length, it's going to be too busy. It's going to be a lot of work in the wheel, and it's going to be not a lot of flow. Uh, so you want to keep the input density at a good medium pace. If I was down around 1920, uh, it, it would be too easy of a course. There wouldn't be that much turning. 
Uh, right around 25 is a real happy point here at route 66. And so with that, I've mapped off my 25 key inputs, and then I've divided that by four. And then I've counted out these four key elements, that's corner one. These four elements, that's corner two. And I've went through the course that way. Uh, ideally, in a perfect world, I should be there at the driver's meeting and have a corner captain meeting and define these work areas. Uh, but you know, we've been doing this for so long here, and we have a lot of repeat customers, um, and a lot of people know what they're doing. So typically, what our corners will do is the corner captains will get out there and course that corner one, this corner two, what are you covering up to? Of course, I've already planned it out, but I may be doing some behind closed doors stuff or making the event work, so I can't always be there to uh, give everyone all the information that I wish they had. Um, so you know, again, with corner uh, corner workers, it's kind of uh, it's first and foremost, but also uh, kind of an afterthought in the respect of where exactly they are. Just making sure they're safe. There's no one coming at them in two directions. They're not pinned against a wall between a wall and a maneuver and a car coming at them. Things like that. Pinnacle. Um, exactly where they uh, are set up is going to be really dependent on site and uh, staffing, of course. Tomorrow we're going to be very lightly staffed on all four corners. Fortunately, it should be a fairly easy course on a couple places that are cone intensive. And I think what I've drawn up as the basis for uh, Sunday's course should be a relatively easy course. I anticipate a decent amount of cone strikes, uh, basically because of the temperatures. Uh, but one way you can judge your courses, uh, and everyone is going to judge your course, is how many DNFs. A lot of people get lost on your course. If everyone's getting lost on your course, and they're not going to have a good time, they're not going to come back. So that's always bad. Uh, if the DNFs, if you look through the results after the fact, and the DNFs are someone like me, and we've been doing this for 20 years, and that little hot foot was just pushing it too hard and blew that turn every single time, well, I'm not going to count that against my course so much. If it's the novices, it's the second year guy, third year guy, they got one clean run. You know, one run that wasn't a DNF and one heat. I think that might be on me as a course designer. You know, I might have, uh, could have done something a little better, could have directed them a little easier, made their life a little easier. Um, so DNF count is definitely one way to judge your course. Uh, cone count is another way, but again, cone count is subjective because who's hitting the cones, right? Is it Mr. Five-time National Champ that hits a cone on every single run but the one that he wins? <clears throat> or is it somebody that is genuinely not understanding the size of their car and turning into cones? Uh, but me, again, uh, praise is great, uh, but actually without asking for it and getting it is the best reward, the smiles. Like I said earlier, when everyone is coming to the finish lights and you just see that ear to ear grin. Or you see them get out their car and they're like, whoo, 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 whoa, I did my job, I had fun. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, that's what I want, of course, so, you know, I know if I like it, I think y'all will like it, because I've driven quite a few cars, so. <clears throat> So that's kind of how I do things. Um, the, in this, in this uh, Roger Johnson course design manual, somewhere in here, there's a couple of ways of like, hey, you know, be mindful of how you lay out cones because they do look completely different from a different perspective. Um, but somewhere in here, he's got a list of all the cool programs that if you had a super high power computer, you can use to design courses and map and scale and all the fun stuff. Here it is. Adobe Illustrator, Zara, Zoner Draw, Denova Canvas, Coral Draw. I work with 10 millimeters and 3 8 inch drives, so that means nothing to me. Um, but yeah, there's lots of programs out there that people can use. Again, you can import pictures from Google Earth. Uh, AutoCAD is definitely a very accurate way to go about uh, setting up course design and takes some of the guesswork out of you because you can use uh, plotting of different radius and it's a lot of tools, basically, it's, uh, from what I understand, versus me and my pencil eraser and that thing of a job. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I will definitely give everyone as much information as I can. If you want it, I will give it to you. If you need help ever, I am the guy you can message on Facebook Messenger. You can shoot me your course design and be like, hey, I'm not sure what to do here. Or, hey, this is what we did last time. We really liked it. How can we just make it just a little different? Bounce something off me. I love this word enough that I'm always here to help. So, what you got? Anybody? 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 Yeah. Did you yeah. share the, my NASCAR box of death? NASCAR <laughs> box of death. I wish I had Wi-Fi so we could pull up video of it. I'm not sure if there's Wi-Fi in here. <clears throat> you don't yeah. have to have on your computer a scanned in of the course tomorrow that you guys have preliminary 
designed out so we can see. I mean, it is. You have to send one, is it? Or is mm -hmm. it okay. yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I don't deal with computers ever. This is, this is the first time in, uh, or second time in about uh, two months in Up Texas, besides the Panko. So I don't do computer stuff. Like I said, I draw. So that one had 25 or so inputs. Huh? 25 inputs, so it'll be roughly a uh, 55 to 60 second course in a uh, bone stock board focus on 200 treadwear tires. Should be fun. Um, you know, I hope somebody wrote down something and says, hey, Chris, yeah, I think it calls my bone stock. What's that? I would say mine. Somebody's registered in a 2012, and that thing has no business on a racetrack. <laughs> <laughs> it's not an ST. I went for a ride in like an 08 Focus once, and I was like, oh man, they really messed this car up. Because the Bowen Stock ones, the first generation, were actually fun cars to drive. That's why I still have one. Um, yeah, um, you guys all took a look at the uh, course design. There's anything out of the ordinary, anything you, you thought you'd like to address, or is all kind of kind of fun? Looks like it's got some decent flow, or what do you think, guys? I've got a clue. I've never run a problem. Cool, I'm glad you made it out. <laughs> I, I didn't know. get it at all. I'm looking at it I'm like, I don't get it. It's, it's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, hold on, I actually may have something. Because like I said, I was all set up to do a intro to autocross. So I actually have some pretty good information for you, I think. And it seems like everybody's autocross before in this room. And yeah, we're all pretty much veterans. We're, we're the ones that are crazy enough to want to go set it up. I've done a rally cross, and that's it. So this is this is actually straight off the SCCA website. That is what is autocross for the Sports Car Club of America. Um, you might want to give it a tech sheet too if you have a board. We don't actually do tech sheets. No, uh, we do have a tech inspection, uh, tech inspector, but several of What's them. What's involved with this tech inspection? Shake down your wheel bearings. Make sure there's okay. nothing loose in the inside of the car. Sorry. Make sure your battery's strapped down. Okay, no well, loose fluids. What I was gonna do is I was actually gonna front all four jack stands and let you guys just look at it. No. Whatever you want to do now. I mean that's because I got your question. Well, that that would put a lot of liability in our hands to say yes, yeah, your car's pretty good. Yeah. What, what, what's your name? James. James. James or James? James. James. This is our tech sheet. That's what it gives you an idea of what you need to That's our PC against yeah. everything that they know what you do. We might see a little no, more lax in that respect. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's like the ears will still fall off and we're shaking it and your car's No, the they're not. It doesn't leak fluid. You know, it's, it's a come on call <laughs> grassroots sport. You know, the entry fee is between like $30 to $70, depending on where you are in the nation. Uh, so it's a run what you brung, come one, come all. Yeah, that's since you're, since you're the instructor, I'll give you a clean copy. Yeah, no, that's uh, awesome. We expect you to check this by yourself. Yeah, yeah. that yeah. removes you of any liability as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. what we'll do is we'll put initials in the back, so we'll say oh, H for helmet, so we check for helmet, make sure it's the correct helmet. Yeah. That's cool. G for gas cap, make sure you got a gas cap or it's tight. We're going to be doing self tech for our track spring events. I'm not sure if we're still torquing these torque the wheel nuts on the Porsches. It's supposed to be 95, so we do 96, make sure it just clicks. Uh, so you ain't torquing my wheels after I pulled in hot, buddy. <laughs> so what you talking about? Do we, we, do we need a helmet for wow. We have lower helmets available. Okay. No charge. No, uh, uh, we'll we hold on your driver's license while you have our helmet. Right. 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 I kind of, it's a four to Yeah, so I know how to 
That's my good luck. Will he goes on the present doing that? He could have a few lives. I should have the best of so I can always be. Yeah. Well, I've done one of them. It's the internal. Oh, it's internal. Yeah. And I have. I'll get with you for sure. Because I got the four. So we're going to do some information sharing. I know it's it's the slowest car out there. It's heavy. It's not what you need. The three foot cheater bar for that. Slow car, fast driver. Slowest car is the slowest car. Oh, I know. So, gate wise, you say 15 is 15 is the bare minimum for spacing the SCCA. Now that is in the SCCA rulebook. That is one of those things that is underlined, meaning that nationally has to adhere to that, but locally, the SCCA rules don't have to adhere to that. A little bit narrower. You can go a little bit narrower. You don't want to do that when somebody is executing a turn. This is what we expect. We, uh, so we have a good contingency of uh, resto rods that run with us, um, cam class of all. Uh, so they're driving 60s, 70s, sometimes 50s land yachts that are updated with modern suspension. Uh, you know, all the fun input, uh, power mods and all that stuff. And these cars, they uh, don't do that well. Uh, one, in tight gates, you know, especially if somebody got a lineup beforehand. And you know, the choked entries, choked exits, it really doesn't give them that option uh, to run. Now I know if you're running, you know, just all 911s all day, 24s, you get away with a lot more. Uh, you know, we have to be commercial artists. You know, we have to have a course that works good for this gentleman's 60 horsepower as uh, as pyre. Yeah, was one of them, as pyre. Uh, <laughs> no, we call it the as pyre. And and somebody's you know twin turbo charged CO6. So you know, we you actually have a broad spectrum between a 911 and a 924. It's, uh -huh. it's, 12 horsepower versus God knows what he put under the hood. I mean, come on. Yeah, oh yeah. They're, they're different widths, right? It's like an inch different. I have a question. What's a seat back? Uh, what? I'm sorry? It says on here, seat backs. Okay, what's the what's the actual sentence? Yeah, what? Okay, yes. seat backs must be suitably secured if not equipped with locking devices. Oh, that means if uh, your, your seat has a recline mechanism. Oh, the recline can't I've be never broke. heard of that. There's old, uh, like, 50s cars, they didn't have the seat locked in, and some yeah. Yeah, like the seat the doesn't car. lock in. Yeah, well, that's, that's a feature. <laughs> so, yeah. It, it's like that boat thing. It's like, oh, you wanted that thing that makes you know that the sensor's full? Let's wait till it's all right. Let's wait on the back of the car. I'm on the steering wheel. I'm on the steering wheel. What's what's your common depth? Uh, what's the best depth? Because we tend to, you know, when you come in there hot, you oh, the, uh, brakes. The runoff room. The runoff, yeah. Runoff room to finish. Uh, we're gonna fight for minimum 200 feet. Uh, we have the space here to do it safely. We can pull off 60 side courses with 200 plus feet of runoff, and that's like 200 feet to the last car in grid. Uh, so basically, the way I would have it is 200 feet to right here. This is our grid lines. Mm -hmm. So we would come up to there from 200 feet and then very stop. But as you see, if you're under control of the car, you know the stuck by the throttle, you should be able to steer around there. And you have an additional two, 300 feet. You know, the more the merrier. Uh, unfortunately, a site down in Texas did have a fatality with a junior carter whose throttle hung wide open and there was not adequate runoff from her. What she thought was adequate runoff from was not. There was a chain, fent, uh, chain that connected to uh, Operates and unfortunately she uh, lost her life. It almost took her head off. Oh, um, bad situation. Uh, site got sued. SEC got sued. I don't know whatever came of it, but a lot of people. Uh, nothing good has come of it except for uh, more safety, which that's not a bad thing. You know, the whole 50 foot spacing, the whole extra runoff. You know, again, it's. It's not common, but when it does happen, you gotta make sure that there's adequate space so you're not gonna run into something hard, to solid in this car, uh, spectators, humans, chain link fences, anything that can really jack you up. I've unfortunately been in a modified car with a throttle that hung wide open, and I know damn well that there's a kill switch on the car, there's two of them, but my brain did not react with her at least 15 seconds. And I actually decided that I was gonna loop the car before I remembered that that kill switch is right there. So as I did my Scandinavian flip to spin the car to try and stall it, I was like, oh yeah, there's a kill switch. And with one finger while I turned the wheel, I hit the kill switch. And I was looking right at a chain link fence, and after that, there's a 200 foot deep retention pond. So had I not had that extra runoff room, 
giving me that extra 15 seconds of brain fart time. Like, why is the brakes not working? Why is the car not slowing down? Why, oh my God, what's going to happen? I got to go this way now. Oh, now I got to open oh, kill switch. If I was 150 foot stop box, human standing there waving a flag, hey! <laughs> Good luck. Dion. <laughs> 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 That'll be the least of your words. Um, so yeah, anybody have anything with regards to the course uh, that I showed you around? Uh, I know the first one was kind of a stinker. First one that I sent out, um, right off the bat, where the corner worker is going to sit, right? That first part of the course was tight. Overlapped over itself twice. Really tight, too. Um, we got a little bit too tight and pinchy at the uh, turnaround, if I remember correctly, yeah. as well. Nine to 45. And uh, it's not marked on there, and uh, but we did the finish went right at and pointed at the biggest pole on the whole property. Uh, so you would be at terminal velocity less than 100 feet from a six foot lighting pole. Um, so there was quite a few minor errors. If somebody that knew the site very well, like Pete did. It didn't take him more than two minutes to call back to be like, hey, brother, we can try to pull here. It's like, pulling your legs. <laughs> I was testing you, seeing where you're at. It's the start of the year. Let's, uh, let's get off to a good start. He helped me prepare a lot of the stuff for this evening. So like I said, he's my confidence. He's my course designer. Now, the one that I sent around that was measured off with my walking meters, um, I think it should play pretty well. Um, you know, we're going to come out right off the light stage. You're going to take a hard left. You have a nice sweeper right to build up some speed. You got three little quick little slalom cones there, and a little tight appeared walled off uh, left going into a right. Is that number nine? Yep, eight and nine. And those two look rough, but that's kind of a shoot the gap area between the minimum space in between a immovable object, and that weird box there is a place where a top fuel car burned to the ground, and there's a nice indentation that'll be a puddle all day. So we kind of have to skirt right through there the right way. Now, with my cones being drawn by pencils, as I said earlier, they are roughly the size of Mini Cooper. So I can move any cone on this paper about five foot in any direction and not mess up the, the gist of the course too, bad, too much. So I know I'm all right there. I've skirted that section many times. It looks tight. It looks choked off. It looks bad. But when I set it up tomorrow, it's going to look all right. Uh, after that, we got a nice gradual left and a right, and that's going into a kind of off-camber, on-camber, off-camber area through there, which we have a couple of high-speed sweeps that increase in spacing. Uh, the spacing increases, let's see, what do we got? We're at 16, we go from 75 to 87 to 90 to 112 to 115, so each cone is going to be X amount of feet further, and therefore you're going to be carrying more speed or so you think, because the offsets are different. <laughs> it also flattens out about halfway down, and it's no longer a camber issue. But then it becomes a, hey, isn't this where they park all the dirt track cars, and this is always coupled with mud over here? <laughs> These are side issues that, you know, if you don't know about, now tomorrow or Sunday, uh, it's not going to be that big of an issue. There's no dirt track event that's worrying now and then. And uh, I've already checked it out, and it's pretty dry and, and clear of dirt. But later in the year, when you come to set up a course in late August or something, if I plan to go right over there, for all I know, there's going to be three inches of mud caked right in that spot. That's where they pull the junk off the demo derby track, and park it right there, and let it dry off. So, it's things you've got to plan for. Um, but yeah, we should be all right there. Now, it gives us a little short run into a kinked, choked exit appearing turnaround. 23 and 24. It looks rough, but the line choice going into that turn is going to dictate exactly how much speed you carry on the exit of it. From 23 to 26, you should be under full acceleration in almost a straight line. Um, and after that, you got to start wiggling the car to make it dance. And then we're going to have our SECA rulebook kind of says you should have a slow down maneuver before your run to the finish. That is what I did here with a sharp left, which should be taken at high speed, and a, oh my goodness, I hope the car holds back into the right through the lights. Throwing caution into the wind with our timing lights is not something we necessarily want to do. 
So we probably end up fixing that finish just a touch. That was the only thing that I saw in there that I was going to tweak. But again, the first thing I'm doing, on, or first thing that we are doing tomorrow when we set up this course, is we're going to set that finish. We're going to set it up. We're going to leave it there, and we're going to walk over and go to the start and start laying out the course from there. Should lay out pretty straightforward. We'll encounter any obstacles and adjust as needed. Does anybody have anything they want to add to that? So between 16 and 20, for example, you're coming in pretty hot. You're more close. You're keeping, I don't know, is that a curb to your right, or you're keeping that? Somebody's not going to blow through the open, or is there a cone it's, right over there? It's, it's the wide open, that whole area. Okay. Um, it's bigger than the, pa the paper shows. Right. Um, so it's from 17 to 20 is almost flat, and it's just slight grade going downhill to the inside. So that works well as long as we're not going too sharp to the right. Mm. Uh, virtually flat, almost flat. It's a good area. It gets close to a fence. We have had cars eat the fence over there um, with experienced drivers, but we're not putting a lot of uh, steering input into the car at that point. Uh, we're more gaining speed and uh, kind of just weaving through that uh, traffic and from the right lane all the way to the left lane, right, as soon as you get on 355. 2021 looks like it'd be a pretty tight left. 2021 is going to get, make you use the brakes. Now, the severity of that is going to be dictated by how the the plot actually looks when we set it up. Um, I know I have it set at, what did I say, 2021. We've got it going 80 feet and then 87 to the left. So, and then from 19 to 20, it was only 10 feet right. So 19 to 20 isn't that big of an issue. What we can do is we could pull 20 back to the left, about five feet, bring 21 to the right, about 10 feet. That will soften up that a lot, and it'll allow you to carry a little bit more speed into that area. But the one thing that you may not know about this area is right, directly to the right of cone 22, is a glowing yellow K-rail. <laughs> it puts the fear of God into every man, woman, and child that drives at it. And it doesn't matter how far away you are, because it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it ain't going nowhere. I've seen a car hit it. I saw a WRX hit one, and it went up, and it came right back down on top of it. The K-Rail didn't move. <laughs> so, so yellow code to keep on your left, right? So yeah, you're going to be carrying a boatload of speed from 16 through 20. 20, you're going to want to shut it down and get over to 21. A little bit of gas between 21, and you got to pick the right line to go through 23. So. Yes, uh, 20 to 21, probably get softened up. The finish, probably get softened up. Aside from that, it's going to lay out pretty close to how it's set up here. As long as it's not a mirror <laughs> image of some of the stuff that Fishy did, which from 9 to 15 is almost identical to what Fishy did today. So that may get tweaked a little bit just to change the degree of camber, because in that whole area there is uh, slope for drainage and there is a uh, storm drain right at cone 16. The blown up patch is right at cone 17. So it's, a, it's an interesting area to work through right there. Uh, but again, that's, that's the whole part of not being married to the course. I got a good plan. Will it work out exactly as I laid it out? Probably not. So we have the big numbers, one, two, three, four, that's your corner workers there. Right? Yes, that's my corner worker stations, and I always want my corner captains at the end of the station, so everything that they're watching, their responsibilities in front of them. Now the course that you guys do over here on the other track, uh, later in the season you mentioned, it's a lot more, this one's more... This is virgin territory. This is new to all of us. I have thrown my name in the hat. I want to design there. It's more square than this. this uh, so what I have been told is we have back street. So that's pretty wide. It does have some banking. Five degrees right there, maybe? Three to five, something like that. So there is some banking. I don't know how much of this infield we actually have or can use, but that big, giant area is where Chicago Reading is using. It's not going to work out to be anywhere near as big as this side, uh, but you know what? It's it's a site we can autocross, and we're never going to have anybody complain about noise. So, 
you probably have minimal pavement issues there as well, right? Yeah, small lot autocross is better than no autocross. Like I said, autocross sites are disappearing. People are complaining. People with money are trying to stop our sport because oh, no. they don't want to hear it. If we can get into a race venue like this, that small lot may actually be the future home for the next 15, 20 years of the sport. You know, maybe we can funnel money and have them pave a little more of that infield and uh, get a little more flat portion out there. And uh, being in cahoots with a, uh, a real deal racetrack is huge. Bigger than getting getting issues off the here? airport. I'm sorry? You guys getting issues off here for autocross? Not here. No, I would hope. <laughs> They're back on. I cancel okay. back on my car stop. Uh, we are one of the few sites that does not have sound restrictions. We do uh, we do say 100 decibels, but we don't run sound equipment. I have run enough sound equipment through the years that I can tell what 100 decibel sounds like from a good distance. Uh, uh, my car used to sound like a If you cringe, it's too loud. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What, what was the old saying though? If your rotary's brap bap bapping through a straight pipe, I'm talking to you. <laughs> yeah, there's been some cars, and I know some guys that went to sites and when they uh, found out that, oh, they're not running sound equipment today, they pulled the muffler off their Integra. And it's like, no, you don't understand. <laughs> We're going to lose the site. It's not about whether we have the sound equipment up. It's about neighbors complaining. Unfortunately, that's one of the sites that disappeared. I don't think that's a direct reason of it, but. Again, it happens. It happened to one of the biggest and most well-run regions in the United States. So it could happen to anyone. It happened to us. We lost Route 66, uh, Chicago region, did several years ago. Uh, something about the new owners of the dirt track and something about scheduling and Chicago region flip-flopped and jumped around to a few sites and salvaged what they could for a season. Since then, we've reopened the doors. Obviously, we're back. And I said, let's in this building. Uh, but yeah, sites are hard to come by. Do what you can. Maintain those relationships. Anybody needs help with any site, reach out to me. I'll get in touch with the right people. I've got good tech contacts. I've got great information. I've got scripts that were been used and worked by previous presidents of the club. I know how to approach an airport. I don't know how to approach the FAA. <laughs> I got a good script to go at an airport. Um, <laughs> so if anybody knows anybody who works at Aurora, by the way, I want to talk to them. Uh, aside from that, let's. What you got? Fire, fire away? I know I keep talking. I'll mm -hmm. probably keep talking if you let me, but. <laughs> In general, with um, course design, if there is a loop element, what, how do you set up your course workers? Having been a course worker on one route, really hard to get out of the way. She yeah. talked about mine. I didn't know you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, you know, if course workers, like something like that, like a pop store or a spin cone or something like that, cannot be safely manned. Um, you gotta space it. You gotta space the cars. Yes, exactly. exactly. That's what I'm going for. You gotta space the cars out uh, accordingly, and have somebody that can be at least, you know, 45. Somebody able-bodied that can be 45 feet off of that main cone that's gonna get nailed, mm -hmm. and they can be able to run out there, reset, and half jog back while looking at the car coming at them. So, if you do something like that, you know, you're gonna have to increase the spacing to keep workers safe. That's basically all I see about that. Um, you know, I understand different clubs do different things. I don't want to say that's a no fun. So, so she's asking, and I still don't know what it is either. What the hell is a popsicle? Same thing. Popsicle is just a same single cone. Got to go around one way or the other. Optional. Uh, you turn. Uh, this so. was this was like a an all. It was almost like a road. I, I forget how it's set up. It's. I, I was just curious about that because it was fun to drive. I really enjoyed driving. I did not enjoy working that. Way. Mm. <laughs> so just to give you guys a little insight of how bad it was, it was at Boomers. We had a lot of cones, we had a lot of area. I didn't know what the hell to do with it. And I thought, ha, let's make it NASCAR today. So I made a very large square. You're coming off of the corner. I don't know if anybody's been to Boomers, but came off the back corner. And basically, there was a s small straight. And what I did was I made straightaway, hard left, 90 degree turn. Straightaway, 90 degrees. So literally, you boxed yourself in. And then when you were about to tee into the original straightaway, you're making another hard 90 back out towards the exit, and you're crossing over where you just drove. So basically, I made you do a huge box and then out. And then the stop box was ahead of it. But unfortunately, some people are like, hey, I get it. This last corner, I can just throttle the hell out of it and right in the stop box. 
we had to keep moving the stop box back and then we had to move it offset because basically it was like the longest straight we had in the whole course after they finally figured out how to do it. And, and yes, Heather is correct. Um, people just lost their minds. They didn't understand what it meant to go. I kept saying, turn left. What do I do at the corner? You turn left. What so do I do at the other corner? My question turn is, left. how many people like me, halfway through the event, rotated their tires from side to side? Because you were just jacking up their right side tires all day. I didn't get that many complaints. <laughs> many but it, it was fun. But I think the problem was that we want to get as many friggin' runs as we can. So the person at the starting line was just launching cars after another. Yeah. And Unfortunately, yeah, one car's exiting, the other one's about to come into the, to the crazy little loop I had. Yeah. And, and you just couldn't run fast enough. And there was nowhere out. You had to run in, do your thing, and then run the hell back. Because on the other side, there's more force. Now, uh, with your club, do people like, would somebody come to a stop if a cone wasn't there and be like, now I want to rerun? No. No. <laughs> no. That's because that, that's an SECA rule. Yeah, if there's good. a cone out of place, you have the, every right to come to the complete stop on the course, raise your hand at the window, corner will point. acknowledge you, course element is missing, you get a rerun. Yes. No, that's perfectly fair, but that you know becomes a time issue. Yeah, we don't have time. That, that, and I think that's the problem. If we had more time in between the cars, it would have been a lot more fun. But we were trying to get as many friggin' runs as we could. And it was, it was, <laughs> and you, you probably, you probably cost yourself some runs because you're launching too quick. Maybe if you had just a little bit moderate spacing, a little bit better spacing, and you could get the course reset. And yes. So, yes. in an like event like that, how many runs do you get in a day? Well, yeah, when you were talking about the harder elements in the beginning or the crossovers in the beginning, mm -hmm. if we had that element in the beginning where it was, okay, everybody's watching it mm -hmm. in the line, everybody's like, oh, you're just turning left and then you exit. Holy crap. And you had the starter physically there saying, okay, are you ready? Yeah. Wait. Go. Yeah. It's, because now you can see. Yeah. It's, it's clear as day. Yeah. Guy clears that section. So, now it's safe for you to drive. And, boom. and we had a crossover at the beginning somewhere at Boomers once. And it was like little element, little element, goofy crossover people. Like, what the hell is this? And then element outside and you came back. And people were like, what is it? And when they started driving, they were like, Wow, that's cool, you just a little crossover. Mm -hmm. But it was in the beginning, and you could see it. I did a crossover in Peru, and I did not make it a clearly defined uh, crossover. What a lot of uh, clubs do, or a lot, a lot of course designers rather will do, is when they do a crossover, they'll lay pretty much a big ass iron cross of cones to say, hey, this is where you cross over, right? So, excited, isn't it? Did you literally put four cones in the box? So, we, we put at least double counts, meaning that you go to the element twice. So, like, that's how a lot of crossovers you'll see. So, you'll yes. do this way and come back around that way. Well, I did a course in Peru, and I did away with everything except for this one, that one, that one, that one, that one. That one. <laughs> so, all these. Course corner worker hazard cones were gone. Now you had to actually follow the chalk line to know. And some people kind of say, "Well, I can go right here and go that way." Are you following the course as it's intended? No, I drew a chalk line. You go straight this way, intended path. That pointer cone here. So that when you're coming this way, hey, I'm turning here. Hey, I'm turning here. So you came around this way, and then boom, straight through. Hey, you go into this cone. We used our crossover to expand the area so we could use yeah. what we had. Yeah. So you had a couple of little min mini elements over one way, do something else on the way back, mm -hmm. and then cross over and out of the area. Because we had a weird area of wedge thing that's kind of hard to use. And that's that's what we did. But you can make something like a common wall in an area like that where you know the outside wall of this turn on this part of the course, it lays back around, it comes like 180 and it comes back down and now that's the outside wall of a different turn, so it's a shared wall. Uh, but that would also have to be like, you know, in the first part of the course, so that way you don't have a possible head-on collision. So that's so, your, your trigger for the next cars when they're out. If, yeah, if, if time, as long as they're not going to catch the next guy. But yeah, you could absolutely, you know, reuse the same part of the course again coming back through. Um, Great River Region, they run at a very small airport and they run two lap courses. Period. So you literally do the whole course, come back Twice. and yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hot, you just run it. Yeah. You, you, you run it, you run it through, you don't come back through this 
do, do the start, but you know, you come out the start, you, you run a course, run the like figure course. eight or something, then yep. you, you come back into it again, yep. and you run the course again the next time through, you yeah. go through the finish. Yeah, yeah. it's a it's a little sided. It's just it's yeah. to make it, it gets as the best job done. Yeah, it works. It, it actually works, works done. really well. It, it does. It does. Cool. It's we did that too on the small floor. It, the one thing you do have have with it, of course, and that's one of the things also is site size, the number of participants you have, and if if an efficiency getting things through that site probably any more than 50 55 people we couldn't efficiently get through because you basically can only have one car on course until someone has committed to the finish it's not a long course so it goes through pretty quickly but that's also a consideration is how to, to make sure you get through everyone in, a, in an event yeah yeah you're fighting with that issue on our potential new side I've been looking at that with my teeth just like what can we do with that it's 200 feet wide right no it's a hundred uh, the, the first section is 100 feet wide. Right, right. That and the is. second section is 150 feet wide. It's only 150? But, I thought it was 200. No, it's 150. But it's 3,500 3, long. That's across the street, right? And, uh, no, no, that's Rantoul. Rantoul. We're talking about. Uh, it's an uh, airport it's a, runway from the yeah, 50s. And the pro but the problem is that you have, uh, you have a, a grace every 200 feet. Mm -hmm. So there's no way, there's no way you can have. Two Basically, cars. there's no problem, no way you can have two cars. So the best idea we have right now is, was um, what I drew up, where you basically you start the first car, then you wait until it's in the middle, you start the second car, then you wait until both cars finish, and then you start the next one. And mm -hmm. you again like a like a staggered, like a 10 second release, yeah. and then it's a 30 second. So you end up So So they're both on the same part of the course essentially, so right. not chancing ahead on collision. So that, that can get risky. Um, I know what the challenge is. I've looked at the site. I've thought about it. Yeah. I was thinking about designing something there too, and it's yeah. like there looks like there's right. only well, a few places. Once you get into that narrow part, it's like you go down and you could come back. Right. I think you'd have to to wait to release until after the car made the U-turn at the skinny end was coming back down at least halfway through before you right. start the next car. Right. Just that you don't want them both down in that. The, the other thing. The, same the other thing you can do is um, that, that that is possible is you take your whole grid. And put it on the on the long end, mm -hmm. and then you basically shut down the your, yeah. your exit, and then you run from there into the into the skinny bit, and then as the car comes out, you can start the next one. Yeah. And then that way, you, you the problem is that if anybody has to go to the paddock yeah, and leave the say, side during the event, you, there's no way you have to stop yeah. the event so anybody can leave because there's only one entry and exit. That was one of my concerns with starting in the middle tomorrow is not having people to police, uh, you know, the, the entry where you have a spectator just come in and be like, oh, hey, look, they're racing no, on the other side of this wall. Let me hop on the we wall. We have always people to police. The waiver. Yeah. Oh, the waiver is always, always loaded. Mm -hmm. so, but, yeah, it's, but, but we could be, luckily, we're back on the original side. Yeah, I heard. That's good. So I guess right now our deadline is June 15. If the money is not there June 15, the deal is off. And then, and then you can keep running there, yeah? yeah. Cool, well, I hope it works out because we're coming down in July. We're taking over a pair yeah. of events down there. Yeah, I heard that. Cool. I was trying to get Fincham to, to get you guys to relinquish course design for one of the days. I don't know if I personally can make it though. Well, who's the event chair? It doesn't have one listed yet for July 13th. You can be the event chair and then you can design the course. Well, I think it should be more like uh, like you do one course on Saturday, I'll do the course on Sunday, be like the Tri State versus can, Champaign can County type out. thing. <laughs> so far as I, as I know, I'm nobody not sure I'll be able to make it, but uh, nobody is. So what? I'm not sure I'll be able to make it to that one. I still got to work out some family stuff, but right. I hope to make well, it down. I'm sure we can do that. Yeah. I'm sure that's possible. Well, I don't want to bring the F mod down there. <laughs> I want to get on some concrete before right. I can. Right. Um, yeah, so I hope that works out. We'll definitely see that one way or the other club for sure. Um, Anyone else got anything? We're kind of close to nine. I don't know if they want to kick me out right at nine or kick us out right at nine. But uh, past nine, past nine. Yeah, they don't want to kick us out too much. <laughs> anybody got any questions? Anything they want to talk about? From last time, last call. Uh, I have one question. Like, sure. Because it's my first time across. Like, yeah. What are like the the do's and don'ts? Like, obviously not the obvious ones. Like, don't do the like, a normal person would be like what's something that I'm expected to do. I mean, ask. Ask, yeah, just okay. ask questions. Ask questions. Don't be afraid. Okay, so, so so if I have a question, find someone that looks competent, that looks like they know what they're doing. Ask and them. most people are are friendly enough that if they don't know the answer, they're going to direct you to someone that does. Okay. Um, 
You'll know the most part, I think everyone is going to do their best to answer. Kind of shirt yeah. or jacket. Yeah. Okay, so you the people that look like they're working a place, like, hey, I have this, or can I do this, can I do that? My, my car's on fire. Can, can you know? <laughs> do you register for the autocross school next weekend? You should. Yeah, there's there is no other. I think I've been there last year. Hmm. Last year. It was like what? It was like when I went. I went to this school, and it was like a it, like Blackhawk Farms. No, 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 this is an autocross. School. This is auto. Yeah. Two, day, two day autocross school here. Yeah, it's there's a two day autocross school that takes place here. It's called the uh, Classroom session and a lot of seat time. Uh, you get to drive on time. two separate autocross courses on uh, Saturday, and they combine into one big course on a Sunday, and it's run like a regular event. Lots of seat time, lots of one-on-one -on -one instruction. Uh, price point isn't that bad. I think it's like 120 Next weekend, or something. Right. And Saturday and Sunday. You get lunch both days. Okay. It's um, um, on Motorsports Reg. Oh, yeah, I know where that is. So it's, yeah. called, it's called Learning the Learning Curve. curve. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. fantastic. Highly recommend it. We'll be talking about it tomorrow. Um, you'll get lots of free swag tomorrow, too. you got the schedule for everything on there. I don't think I had the Learning Curve on the schedule. It's, it's, it's on the schedule. I mean, it is. Okay. Okay. I'm sure I can wander on a Facebook. Yeah, yeah. Right. Their you know. Facebook isn't as fantastic as Tri State's. I'm one of my fingers, <laughs> but uh, I got a really good crack team on top of our <laughs> internet stuffs and main creation. Um, so, yeah, just yeah, pop it. I'll be there all day. I might be tired and cranky, uh, but I'm still mostly from. Bring him coffee. He'll probably be happier. No, Red, Bull. Red Bull. Red Bull. Coffee, I'll like. Um, if you're seriously interested in autocross and figuring out what your car does, thresholds, and all this stuff, do the learning curve. It, it, was, it was amazing. I, I was working with the PCA for a couple of years, and then I said, okay, I suck. I need to get a little better. I need an edge. What, what's going on? I did the learning curve with some other guys. Hey. And it was literally two Better days of getting your ass well, up by a third. booted. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, was okay, here, awesome. we're here. Can we start over? Yeah. Watch the video off some more. Fantastic class. Oh, okay. Just make a little bit of noise if it's still going. So this is for me. This is my first. Yeah, this is my first.